Good afternoon. Um, my name is Joy Barnes Johnson, and I am online with three of my colleagues um, around the Northeast area. Today we will be doing a webinar titled Teaching High Needs Populations with the Common Core in Mind. During this session, we will share tools for K through 16 instruction that supports common core lesson planning and curriculum design. My name is Joy Barnes Johnson. I am a secondary science teacher in New Jersey. On the line, we have three other educators. They will mention their name and their specialization and declare where they are from. Hello, my name is Paige Hinton Mason. I am a secondary high school special ed teacher. I co-teach an earth science class and an algebra one class. Okay, Jerry. Hello, my name is Jerry Johnson. I am a school-based teacher leader in Philadelphia of the school K through eight school, and I teach uh, special ed as well as general education and middle school students. And Rakima. Hi, good afternoon everyone. My name is Rakima Stokes Little. I am the assistant director of the New Jersey Garrett program um, in Trenton, New Jersey at Mercer County Community College and I also teach developmental English here at Mercer County um, Community College. Okay, great. So we are your panelists and we hope to share several tools with you as we go through today's session. The goal of this webinar is basically to engage you in the discussion and the use of various tools that we ourselves use in our teaching contexts. You will have an opportunity to actually uh, use some of these tools in real time. They will appear in the chat menu. If you have any questions, please feel free to type your questions in and I will do my best to answer the questions um, as they are given. We already have one question that we, from Mary that we will actually address a little bit later. So to begin, we first need to define what we mean by special or high needs population. We are attending to three major um, themes in the high needs or special needs group. We're talking about culturally diverse students, a large range of cognitive and behavioral abilities, and then multiple teaching contexts. So we are looking at co-teaching. We're looking at um, various adults in the room that are not necessarily certified teachers. We're looking at informal educational settings and technology constrained or enhanced environments. So what is the Common Core and how is it um, that it's taking such prominence in the way that we do teaching and learning? Well, basically it is a paradigm shift from traditional teaching to an inquiry-based model of teaching that really is an opportunity to scaffold instruction. It's inquiry because students will have opportunities to explore a variety of texts that include not just words but pictures and have opportunities to have dialogue or communicate across various borders to document, to write um, their stream of consciousness thought as well as very formal thought, to analyze a variety of texts that are uh, authored by them, self-authored texts as well as an analysis of peer text or informational text and narrative that's already published. One additional benefit of this paradigm shift is the opportunity to actually write in collaboration with peers. So there are a variety of tools that exist that will enable that as well. So by the fourth grade, what should children actually know and be able to do? What kinds of things should they be reading? So the New York Times posted an article just last week 
that exposes what children should actually read. If you actually have an opportunity to peruse this, you can actually see there's this concept of um, what does the Common Core mean. But later on in this blog, they actually describe what that means and looks like. Among them, they describe things like historical documents, scientific traits, maps, and transit schedules, and recipes as early as the fourth grade. So these are, again, opportunities even to differentiate instruction. So the characteristics of a Common Core lesson are this. Multiple means of communication, various opportunities for collaboration, critical thinking, and effective use of technology, whether it be low-tech or high-tech, the use of various tools to help students realize the goals of the Common Core are what we're looking at. So this is an opportunity for interdisciplinary instruction. And what you'll see here is a graphic organizer, a Venn diagram that's kind of been um, modified to reflect that you have various uh, places where you have multiple content areas and ideas sort of coming together to create a puzzle. This modified Venn diagram is actually taken from research being done in North Carolina that looks at uh, graphic organizers in the same vein as uh, Marzano's use of graphic organizers as a means for highly effective instruction. So some background on the standards. If we think about how the standards are organized, it's organized by grade level, but also into categories. For example, there are reading standards for informational texts across the grade levels, but there are also standards for reading of narrative. There are writing standards um, as well. So, uh, the common, standard, common Core Standards represent opportunities to present a large array of literacy skills. So we're going to start with um, a little activity that I'd like you all to engage. So in the chat box now you should see a link that actually um, is to time.com. I'll paste it here this first link. Sorry about that. Let me go back. All right, I'll take you there. Hold on one second. What I'd like you to consider before we actually get started is imagery. What information is being decoded or being represented, being shared in this photo? And if you had to come up with a title for it, what would that title be? Think about captions as well and how those three things work together to not only inform but to narrate a story. So this is a familiar story at this point in our history, but before we actually um, read the caption, look at the image here. And if you had to come up with a word, if you had to come up with a word that actually explains um, what is happening here, you might choose cross. Another student might choose smoke. Another choose, might choose debris. Either term that they use, they can then take that, share those ideas, and then build a full story. Let's go to another one. Note how the smoke in this image is different. So if you're using this, for example, in a high school science classroom, you could have students compare the smoke in this first image, oops, ads, <laughs> compare the smoke in this first image 
to the smoke in this second image and begin to talk to each other about why the smoke is different. Have them imagine what's actually happening here and then compare the history. <clears throat> what I like about this photo essay is that in addition to having really amazing pictures, there is a title associated with each picture and a short description that from there you could have students embellish further. So you're free to actually go ahead, use the link that's now appearing in your chat box to click through a few more if you like ideas. I'm going to resume the presentation. Here's another example of ways to use real images as picture prompts for writing. In a science class, you might ask students to explain what actually caused the, the glass to break. Then, in a social studies class, you might be able to explain how this image reflects um, pathology of, of broken glass. There are several sociological articles, for example, about broken glass and what mayors do in cities to make sure that there's no broken glass. And in the end, we're left to ask ourselves, why is the Common Core important? So beside my voice, you will hear the other panelists now, each describing briefly um, why the Common Core is important in the early childhood or early year experience, the middle level, the secondary general, the secondary special ed, as well as post-secondary perspective. Here's a, a focus question. How do the Common Core standards relate to NCLB? How do they relate to Park and 21st century skills. So we'll start with, with Jerry. Hello, everyone. When we consider the Common Core and the critical components of the Common Core in terms of attaining the goal of the Common Core, we're looking at these three components that when they are um, equally shared and equally committed to, will bring some sense of balance. However, when we're talking about um, any one of these three components, which would be the common core standards, the core curriculum, or your district standards, the state standards, and then you have the actual implementation um, of the actual lesson. So you need all three components to bring not only relevant, but you need all three components to bring balance. When you talk about meeting the needs of diverse students, whether it's a cultural, cultural perspective or whether it is an academic perspective, if that student, for example, or early childhood has a family service plan or IFSP or an IEP, that IEP then wedges between the core curriculum and the actual implementation or the appropriate strategies and tools that you use as uh, as, as a professional. And so in line with Marzano's high yield structure um, strategies, you want to make sure that in essence you are balancing what you do with what the child needs. So when you look at, for example, a standard, if that standard for a third grade student is to, is to multiply single digit uh, single-digit numbers, how do you meet the needs of a student who is not yet attained that level of mastery? So from, from its most fundamental uh, perspective, instead of using terminology that the child may not be able to understand, you still give them an opportunity to access the curriculum by instead giving them a more kinesthetic approach and using actual manipulatives and forming groups, integrating critical vocabulary. Okay. It's important that everything that we do as professionals is not only developmentally appropriate, but it, that it is also academically rigorous. So when we consider um, 
meeting the needs of early childhood, there are a few things that I wanted to bring out. How do we link the curriculum to an early childhood standard? So what is it that we're really doing? We're, sent, we're extending a message as a professional, taking an approach to learning that will help younger children not only construct and gather information, but to utilize that information in realistic um, experiences, in learning experiences. So our hope is, for example, for a student who is in preschool, the child is three years old. What would be considered developmentally appropriate for a three-year-old? Our goal is to invoke a creative um, pedagogy, if you will, um, to complete a task and analyze that child's ability to stay on task and actually perform the task. And oftentimes, that is using real, um, real material. That's how children at the early age learn best through experiential learning. So if we're looking at math, for example, again, so using the same standard of multiplying one digit, how do we develop that ultimately um, in a preschooler who's three or who's four? So we're looking at being able to measure their ability to understand one-to-one -one correspondence, um, being able to count um, consistently or follow a particular pattern. And what this does is build their fluency in basic math facts. And as they grow and as they're developmentally um, following, as they're developmentally following their natural growth, you as a professional can see if there are some perhaps areas that um, they are not meeting critical developmental milestones. When we look at what is considered critical milestones? If you look in your resources, there are some. There is a link there actually provided for you that is based on um, the actual Center for Disease Control and how we as professionals can help parents assess whether the skills that are being learned in the classroom are actually transferring into their home environment. On the next slide, as we consider the instructional focus, when we're looking at our instructional focus, particularly for early childhood and middle years, we're still considering not only what is developmentally appropriate, what is academically rigorous, but we're also looking at what will build as a transitional period of time in the curriculum as they branch from preschool into grade school. And then grade school, they have transitional periods as well. And that is from the K through 2 grade band and transitioning into a tested grade level at third grade. And generally speaking, third through fifth grade is also another grade band. And then you have the third grade band all in an elementary level span, which is transitional period number three for them. And that's grade six through eight. Then again, creating another transitional period for them in grades nine to twelve. So we're we're uh, we have this awesome challenge of using create creativity ours and theirs, using opportunities for them to develop their language, to engage with the complexity of the text, giving them opportunities to exchange their own ideas and build arguments, and that can be done from preschool all the way through high school. So how is it that we as a professional bring them into that conversation? Using inquiry-based opportunities and opportunities for them to think differently and critically about multiple ideas from multiple viewpoints. Children in middle school enjoy acting things out, enjoy moving about the room, enjoy hearing their own voice. And so as we, we develop their, um, their capacity to, to not just uh, do something, but to master something, um, I wanted to share with you a particular strategy that is called a particular strategy where children will be able to take an idea and take notes on it, usually a double 
journal entry um, works best because they engage with the text, ask questions of the text, and look further in into the text to answer the question. So double entry journals are usually very effective for middle school students. And this last strategy, which would be called minute a day shuffle, children enjoy playing cards. And so basically, this is a skill that they're learning from preschool and again all the way through eighth grade. You take just some standard basic facts that work very well with math numeracy, phonics development, and phonemic development, and you're creating and have the students create their own flashcards. And on one side, you have the actual skill that you want them to master. And on the opposite side of that card, you place an actual fact. And so they are having an exchange between information and its meaning. As they develop from preschool through middle school, they become accustomed to not just being able to recall through rote practice, but they're actually making meaningful connections. Does anyone have any questions? I will provide a future link to you on both of these strategies in action. OK. Um, so Jerry just shared the early years and middle school and began the conversation about how it can be applied in high school and beyond. So I would actually like to answer a couple of questions first so that everyone can hear and get the responses. Uh, Mary asked a question, are special ed students going to follow the core standards for their instructional level or grade level? And I would say yes. By full implementation year, which is 2014, it is expected that most states will require general education and special education students to adhere to the standards for the Common Core in both math and language arts. Exactly. Can I add to that um, response? Certainly. Yes. Um, so, so again, in the example that I shared, because the expectation is going to be um, that the states will adopt the Common Core and they will pertain to both high incidence disabilities as well as low incidence disabilities. However, um, the IEP is ultimately what will drive the instruction for students with special needs. So you want to gear your instructional practice towards meeting the child at their ability level, but, um, but basically you're advancing their knowledge and their practice by using the common core standards um, by which that, that ultimately is the goal. But in the example with the um, third grade, in that third grade, again, the standard is to multiply single digits. For a student with an IEP, that, while that is the standard, the actual lesson may be to group um, 15 items in sets of three. So they're actually being able to see the multiplication as a process. Okay. All right. Uh, Rakima, if you would, um, is there any particular application to um, the post-secondary experience that you'd like to share? Um, I would just probably, um, everything from K to 12 is closely aligned to the post-secondary experience. Um, from my perspective, uh, we have a lot of students that come in uh, taking remedial classes. A lot of times they blame it on the K to 12 education. Um, with the Common Core in place and with parks particularly, with the partnership for assessment of readiness for college and careers, um, really on the beginning end of the Common Core is going to help not only post-secondary um, institutions admit and are ready to um, place students in college level classes, um, all of that is just closely um, aligned, starting from the third grade on up. Um, when students end high school, they're going to be college ready. Granted, that's the goal, 
for the Common Core and particularly for, for, for parks. Um, did you want to go into, or you want to wait for me to do? Yeah, I, I'll, I want to, yeah, I'll jump in, okay. I'll jump in here now and do the high school. So what are, some of the, what, what are some of the tools um, that you could use for a high school that actually engage some of this? And so what I wanted to show you here is examples of transcripts. So if, if you're having trouble finding a diversity of text that can be differentiated, I'm a science teacher, so uh, PBS oftentimes will have short videos and provide the transcript, which is the full text available as it is written, which can then be um, shown in class or shared, zoomed in or zoomed out so that students who have um, various accessibility needs, they can actually access the information. One other useful tool is actually to use something like learner.org or some other source of video. For example, I'm just showing you something here that has video on it. Of course, I would pick something uh, that's not quite what I need. Hold on one second. You can pick a video that actually has video on demand. So once you have video on demand, I'm going to choose World of Chemistry. For example, you'll see a resource link. How do we make sense of this extraordinary that has video on demand of products that you can actually choose to actually show the closed caption, which will allow students to also read and listen while they're on the screen. Additional funding provided by the people of God. Okay. So those are some of those resources. So that's what I mean when I said iTunes, which offers a wide array, closed captioning on screen, transcripts personal technologies like mobile phones for calculator use, clickers or surveys, and now tablets are being used in high school for both the general education and the special education context. So here I've provided an example of how you might actually use Google Docs to publish a small amount of text that students can read and can be modified quickly. And then you can use something as simple as Adobe Acrobat to read a PDF, uh-oh, hold on, <laughs> to actually read a file, let me see. Okay, so what I have here is a PDF file of that same text. I can choose read aloud mode, activate the read aloud, and for students who have both reading challenges or who might have language, students you can actually have the computer. Or other informational text, the need to have students interpret and create writing samples is important. You can actually have the computer read the text in real time. That we have found works especially well for students of, um, that are English speakers of other languages. I've provided here also some links for online calculators that can be used in real time as well, not forgetting the numeracy aspects. Okay, one other really important resource is this online differential tutoring. One of the uh, websites that I am particularly fond of actually has a wide range of skills that can be done. But what's useful about this one is you can actually choose what the speaker, a female, a male, a Spanish speaking. So this, for example, you can have differentiated. In this example, we're given three different functions and the problem asks us to find the domain of each. And students are watching. 
Students get an opportunity to watch videos as they would in a tutorial setting um, using a different type of speaker. Uh, the last tool that I'd like to share before Rakima, I sort of defer to Rakima, is the use of Lexile reading scores. Now, if you're looking for periodical text or informational text, EBSCOhost now posts Lexile reading scores on many of their um, on many of their resources. So, when you actually get the PowerPoint, you'll see a link that describes what the Lexile reading framework is like. Very quickly, though. The Lexile Reading is sort of like a tool that's useful to help you figure out, according to grade, where 25 to 75 percent, a majority of your students um, will be reading. So typically, if you are teaching um, high schoolers, you're looking for any, a Lexile score anywhere between 900 and, let's say, 1,200. All right, so Rakeem is going to describe actually the partnership and some of the ideas behind Common Core Beyond High School. Okay. Um, as things begin to implement the Common Core and raise expectations of what students should know and be able to do by the end of high school, it is important to understand the level of college and career readiness of today's students. And um, what I did was I talked a little bit about com community school partnerships and how they're important because not only do they help improve educational outcomes for children, um, there's a huge impact on student achievement. And um, the overall goal is really to ensure the academic success um, of all students. And I, um, the quote from Henderson and Matt, when families of all backgrounds are engaged in their children's learning, their children tend to do better in school, stay in school longer, and pursue higher education. Clearly, children at risk of failure or poor performance can profit from the extra support that engaged families and communities provide. And um, then I go on and I talk a little bit about um, transitioning from high school into college. And there are a lot of grant um, funded programs that help make that transition just a little bit easier for students of, of culturally diverse students. And um, a couple of the programs um, are the TRIO programs, um, Student Support Services, Education Opportunity Fund, and GARAP programs. Many of these programs start in the middle and high school, and they help students prepare not only to graduate high school, but actually go on uh, to post-secondary education. Um, I know the TRIO program, Student Support Services, which includes uh, Upward Bound as well as the Educational Talent Search, um, has been around for years and um, since the uh, 80s um, here in New Jersey, but around the 60s, 1964, I believe, the Upward Bound came into play. And they help low-income uh, disadvantaged uh, students get into to college. Um, the academic support, yes, they have a little monetary support, but the academic support is really what is needed. Um, so they help with the whole retention, um, making sure that not only students get into college, but they have the support mechanisms in place so that they continue on in college and therefore graduate. And those support um, systems may include tutorial services, the one-on-one -on -one with the counselor, um, but more importantly, that summer bridge program. A lot of the summer bridge programs that um, a lot of the schools have are for incoming freshmen so that they can get a little bit more acclimated to the college setting um, to help them with that transition into college. Okay, so we're, we're winding down now. Um, if you haven't had an opportunity to ask a question, please feel free to ask um, as you feel necessary. Yes, uh, one general question that I see a lot is, will this PowerPoint be available for download? And the short answer is yes. <laughs> and the links are available in that text. All right. So Common Core Solutions. At this point, um, you should get a link that says Common Core Solutions in a moment. If not, um, it's in the PowerPoint. But here's a set of resources 
that you can actually access to get details for uh, planning in math and English instruction, including the um, professional development. So as you uh, yourself begin the process of trying to learn more, there are resources available, including um, the reading standards, writing standards, speaking and listening standards, and general language standards. What I like about this resource in particular is, again, this uh, push to actually... Welcome to the Keys to the Common Core. You are viewing the module on the Common Core State Standards for Literacy in History, Social Studies, Science, and Technical Subjects for grades K through 5. In this presentation... So you can see that this provides additional detail um, to support interdisciplinary instruction. We've provided an exhaustive list um, here of resources about the Common Core. Uh, one of the ones that I would like to draw your attention to, especially if you have Spanish-speaking families, is a dialogue on Univision um, that's actually in Spanish. And it was designed for Spanish families to begin to understand this process over time. Oh, that's an ad. <laughs> that's an ad. However, you will <laughs> there is a full explanation of the Common Core in Spanish that can be accessed. Finally, we give some information from Pennsylvania, the Teaching Channel, um, and a few other. Uh, Jerry mentioned the developmental milestones and questions about students with disabilities. We've provided resources there as well. So if there are any additional questions, I'd like to leave a few moments open uh, for your questions. Oh, OK. So um, Rajan asks, are there lessons and samples for upper grades or only for K through 5? Right now, a large number of the lessons that are available on the Common Core Solutions are K-5. However, uh, if you go to the other resources, namely, um, let me speed through the resources, so please pardon the quick turn. Um, the last two slides that have the resources actually have lots of secondary information. So ReadWorks has information for high school and um, ELL Stanford. That actually speaks to ELL learners, but there is also a considerable amount of information available for uh, secondary students as well. If you go to the Common Core Standards link, which I'll take you to there now, um, you can actually find samples this summer um, there was a call out by the organization to actually come up with lessons for the upper grades. And so here are some examples as well uh, from 3 to 12, for example. So there are high school and secondary examples available. Joy, there's a site I did not include. Um, if you can, if you can put that up, <clears throat> excuse me. If you can put it up, that will be great. And um, it's actually funded by the Pennsylvania Department of Education. Okay. It is a free resource, and it is aligned to um, Common Core standards, where professionals can. It's a professional community, so it's a free. It's free to join. But you can create your own assessments. You can create online quizzes and interactive quizzes and games. Um, and it's all free of charge. And um, if I could give that to you now. OK. www.pde, as in Pennsylvania Department of Education, SAS, as in Standard Aligned System, dot org
and you can save assessment. You can choose specific standards that you want to focus on, and this is from preschool through grade 12. I'm actually sending that to everyone right now, that link. All right. So is there any particular place that we should click? OK, when you go on, all right, take a look under Materials and Resources. You can type in a keyword. Like? Maybe the person who asked the question can give you a keyword and what grade level. I chose disaster just because, <laughs> and okay. I chose high school level. And so you can see a range of um, ideas that emerge. So now this is an awesome tool for several reasons. If you want to modify or differentiate your instruction, for students who may be in the 10th grade, but you know they read on a 6th grade level, this would give you an opportunity to stay with the actual core standards that you're trying to look for and utilize resources that are more developmentally and intellectually appropriate for that student. OK. So now, did you see the key that is just above? So if you put in disasters, underneath the grade band or the grade level, each, there, is a, there are icons associated with each of the actual resources. Yes. Um, and so that's what makes this such an awesome tool. And again, if you're differentiating for children who are speakers of other languages or for um, different modalities, this will give you um, an opportunity to save resources that you can always come back to or create your own and add to as a professional community. Oh. OK. Can we go to standards if you're still on this screen? Um, you can choose, a, if you click on the standards tab, You will, okay. follow the same, you will follow the same protocol. So you would choose the grade band. So if you're looking at high school, 9 through 12, or a specific grade. And then you have the specific standard areas. I chose so 10th grade writing. writing. Mm -hmm. So in distinguishing, see how it distinguishes between writing a research paper or actually writing. And there you'll see the standards. And then they will provide for you on the right side of the screen a list of materials that are currently available that you can print and or see. OK. All right. So chemical bond. Oh, chemical bonding, one of my favorite topics. <laughs> so uh, thank you, Ellen. <laughs> so I'm going to go back and actually do the search again with chemical bonding. And uh, under materials and resources, I'm a little slow. I'm sorry. I don't know what. Oh, there we go. Chemical bonding, which would be a 10th or 11th grade skill. I'm going to choose 11. And we see that you've got, oh, stoichiometry, which is math rich. Um, here, this is educator. So this is actually a resource that was created by a teacher in Pennsylvania who shared. Um, here it looks like a, a web-based information. Um, and so there are oh, distillation of hydrocarbons, activities which are probably videos and such. So, oh, crossword puzzles. There are a nice range of activities. Thank you, Ellen, for your question. Is there anything similar to Math TV for literature skills? That is very interesting. Um, 
Not that I'm aware. I'm not aware. Patricia asked, is there anything similar to Math TV for literature? Uh, not that I'm aware, but I would say that because there is a wide range of text-based media online, um, using something like learner.org or, or one of the PBS resources or even Univision, now that they have YouTube channels, um, many of their resources can be accessed in that way. Uh, Khan Academy is another resource that occasionally provides examples of literature and history um, in addition to uh, what's available in math and science. That would be www.conacademy.com. Um, I'll check to make sure. All right. Thank you for asking, Patricia. Let me take us to Khan Academy. It's conacademy.org. I apologize. So I'm showing you on the screen now some of the resources that you can find um, on Khan Academy. So math is available, but if you scroll down, you will see that they have the humanities here. So history, literature, not so much, but there are examples of text that can be accessed. Um, Joy, um, the person who asked about the math TV, Yes. There is um, a very strong um, site, but it, it costs money. Discovery Education is very similar um, in terms of offering videos and, um, and other topics around literacy, but if there, is a, there is a fee involved with that. Mm -hmm. Yes. OK. So that's discovery education. I personally, one of my favorites really is learner.org because mm -hmm. it's, it's um, all, it's just available. So Patricia, you're looking for literature. Let me show you learner.org, which um, I'll put the link here so that you can click along with me. So if you go to learner.org, in the top right-hand side of the screen, you, if you type in literature, you can see literature resources um, and a, a wide array of videos available. Uh, some of the material is actually designed for the teacher, but conversations in literature, for example, shows teachers, but it also shows students, and that video is available. So if you're teaching particular strategies, you can actually use a resource like this. The same would be true for poetry. So if you go back up, so we're going to go back up and change the search to something by discipline, choosing literature and language arts. Um, since we've been in high school, I'm going to go to uh, 6 through 8. You can see what resources are available for that particular grade band. So here are strategies for teaching novels, making meaning, and various um, actual teaching activities. So you get to see how students have responded in real time using these particular resources. I hope that was helpful. OK, so um, we are approaching the end of our uh, time together. And I wanted to take this opportunity again to see if there were any additional questions or things that you would like for us to go back and review. Right. Yeah. OK.
Okay, I'm glad that was helpful. Um, Okay, so we have no more questions. I just want to make sure for a moment that I have actually gone through each of them and responded. Okay. Okay, I think we've answered all of our questions. This has been a very um, exciting time for us as panelists, and we appreciate your coming to join us in this conversation about the Common Core. The last thing I want to show you, however, is uh, if you're not familiar, it's just a tool as simple as Google Drive, which um, will allow you to create a wide range of activities and allow students all to begin the process of collaborating to write text. I use this quite a bit in my science classes and have students do group work. It's a great way for them to share resources and you can change and allow students to save without the problem of wondering or worrying about what computer they're actually on. It saves almost instantly, and once you share, you can share it with any number of people that will allow them to modify the document as you go along. So one last tool that I'd like to show for those of us in secondary math, part of what we are also charged with doing is helping students to write numerical statements, write numbers. And so um, Google Docs has a great way of inserting all kinds of equations that um, will give students practice, for example, representing, um, representing any range of data. And what it does, um, let me see, 4, 12, 19, you have something that actually looks like a real equation now as opposed to random numbers with carrots and so on. So I invite you all to explore how you can use uh, Google Docs to share information, to create documents that use both uh, letters and numbers to help students build their writing. If there are no more questions, I think that's it. Um, we will look forward to sharing the PowerPoint. We will look forward to sharing the PowerPoint um, on the website. And uh, I appreciate your time.